This is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high-quality racing oil for your two-stroke or four, make sure you go to blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. Welcome back to the Motocross Vault. My name is Tony Blazer, and what this video is going to cover is a look back at the 500 shootout of 1988. Uh, this is going to be a review of what the magazines thought of these machines at the time. This is an interesting era because uh, the 500s are still sort of getting updates. Uh, at least Kawasaki and Honda were updating them. Uh, Yamaha was kind of stuck in a time machine with their YZ490, and in 1985, Suzuki had retired their RM500. So you really only have three of the Japanese manufacturers making competitive 500s. Uh, this shootout, though, will contain a little a little bit more variety than the normal shootouts of the time in that uh, at least a couple of the magazines included KTM and also ATK. Uh, now, ATK is a kind of a boutique manufacturer. Um, now, these days, I, I'm not even sure they still exist. They were kind of transitioned to dual sports and some other stuff. They kind of bought out Can uh, Cannondale in the early 2000s. But in the 80s, they were a manufacturer of really unique off-road racers. Uh, the 604 and before that the 560, the four-stroke was kind of their signature machine in the early to mid-80s. And then here in 88, they kind of expanded their lineup to include a 250 and a 406 two-stroke, which were based on these old Rotax designs. I just did a review of the ATK 406 on the channel, so if you want to get a little more in-depth on that, you can check that out. I'll put a link here in the video for that as well if you'd like to learn a little bit more about this specific model. But this is going to cover what the magazines at the time thought of the 500 class. Uh, again, not all the magazines are going to test all the machines. So uh, as if you've seen these others I've done, I rank them based on what the magazines thought. I'll give you a little breakdown on each bike as we go. Uh, this one's going to include motocross action, dirt bike, Super Motocross, which is one of my favorite magazines, kind of an offshoot of Dirt Rider at the time, and then Dirt Rider. So, of course, in the 80s, there were a lot more print publications for motocross than there are now, which is almost doesn't exist, unfortunately. Um, and what I do is I just give you an idea of how they ranked in each shootout and a little bit about each individual motorcycle. Uh, so if you like this sort of thing, I've done several of the shootout reviews. I know these are real popular. Uh, I love reading shootouts. Shootouts are kind of like my favorite thing to read in the magazines, typically. I like looking back at what these uh, different magazines thought of the bikes at the time. It's interesting how, uh, you know, they will each machine will be ranked differently by different magazines a lot of times. Some years, like one bike machine just kicks everybody's butt. Basically, 86, you know, Honda swept everything. Uh, but a lot of years, they have very differing opinions. And I say this year is one of those years where you have some difference of opinion on which is the best machine. So, again, if you like this sort of thing, you can find several other shooter reviews on the channel. Uh, if you like to support what I do, I just started a Patreon page. I would love to hear what you guys think as far as uh, you know, rewards and what have you. I'm new to the Patreon thing. I know uh, maybe I do some motocross vault stickers, a shirt, merch, something, uh, maybe a, like a Q and A. Uh, anyways, I would love if you put a suggestion in the, um, in the comments below, kind of what you'd like to see. Uh, see if it makes sense to you to if you like to support what I do there. I'd really appreciate. It. I'll put a link to that in the description as well. And I also have uh, motocross vault merch available. Uh, several designs, all kinds of uh, cool little motorcycles, including some 500s there. Uh, and I'll put a link and a card here in the video for that as well. Uh, so here is the story of the 1988 500 class and how they ranked in the shootouts of the magazines of the time. Up first, we have the 1988 Honda CR500R. Motocross action that year ranked at third out of six entrants. Dirt bike ranked at first out of four. Dirt rider picked at second out of five. And super motocross picked at second out of three. In 1988, the CR500R remained largely the same burly and beastly machine it had been in 1987. The new dark red color palette updated the looks, but the motor remained largely unchanged, aside from a slight increase in crank inertia. In spite of this small attempt to smooth out the power band, the CR remained the most violent of the 1988 open classers. Power was incredibly explosive off idle, and it ripped into an eye-watering mid-range blast. It was the type of power that shredded tires and relocated shoulder sockets and sent posers back to the 250 class. In the turns, the CR carved like a fat 125, but its high-speed manners continued to be of the white-knuckle variety. Head shake was violent under deceleration, and lock-to-lock -lock swaps were common. The Shawa suspension continued to be very good, and it was actually far better than the newer components found on the redesigned CR250R. The machine's twitchy chassis, explosive motor, and portly disposition made the CR a handful for all but the most talented of riders. It was the very definition of what made the 500 class both loved and feared. If you were man enough to make it work, it was an excellent choice, but if you preferred a little less bite to go with your brap, there were easier to ride choices in 1988. Next up is the 1988 Kawasaki KX500. Motocross Action picked it second out of six, Dirt Bike ranked it second out of four, Dirt Rider 
picked it first out of five, and Super Motocross ranked it first out of three. For 1988, Kawasaki scrapped their complete 87 lineup and introduced an all-new set of machines in every class. This major redesign would actually end up being the last one the mighty KX500 would see, as its basic layout would soldier on for nearly two decades with only minor refinement. New bodywork, which was much bulkier than 1987, a new frame, improved suspension, and a revised KIPS-equipped motor highlighted the changes for 1988. That season, the new KX500 offered by far the best motor in the class with every bit as much power as the earth-scorching Honda, but far less drama. The KIPP system allowed Kawasaki to tune their big green machine for broad and smooth power, which allowed riders to actually use all of its prodigious output. It was the only 500 to offer usable power in all three phases of its power curve, and pulled with awesome authority from bottom to top. It could be short-shifted or revved out with equal effectiveness, and proved versatile enough for both motocross and high-speed desert work. The new suspension offered a huge improvement over the horrendous forks of 1987, and the overall package was plush and well sorted. The handling was also excellent, with solid cornering, but none of the scary head shake found on the Honda. In the not great department were the new ergonomics, which were wide, tall, and fat, brittle plastic, marshmallow seat, cantankerous starting, and grabby clutch. Overall, the KX500 was ranked the best of the 500s from Japan by all but Dirtbike, who favored the Honda's suspension and turning over the green machine's handling. Next up of the Japanese is the Yamaha YZ490. Motocross Action picked it 5th out of 6, Dirtbike ranked it 4th out of 4, Dirt Rider ranked it 4th out of 5, and Super Motocross ranked it 3rd place out of 3. In 1988, the YZ490 was the least expensive machine in the Open class. At $29.99, it undercut the Honda and Kawasaki by $150, the KTM by $700, the ATK 406 by $900, and the ATK 604 by thousands. For that money, you got a simple and reliable 487cc air-cooled single, modern cartridge forks, and rock-solid stability. In terms of outright performance, the YZ offered more than enough power, but it did it in a slightly odd fashion for a 500. But the low end and mid range were mediocre, and most of the 490's power was focused on the top end, where few 500 riders dared to tread. Exacerbating the YZ's lack of low end was its confused jetting, which caused the bike to blubber down low and ping on top. This detonation verged on a death rattle at times, and forced riders to back off well before the big Yamaha got into the meat of its power. No amount of brass swapping was sufficient to alleviate this jetting conundrum, and the only true fix was to have the head reshaped and switch to race gas. Along with the need for engine work, the Yamaha was saddled with teeth-chattering vibration, notchy shifting, and a very busy rear shock. The YZ's rear drum brake also seemed like a throwback to an era time had forgotten. Braking was decent up front, but only mediocre in back. That said, it still offered better feel than the grabby Kawasaki's rear binder, and offered more overall power than the pathetic units found on the KTM and ATK. While the YZ was slightly behind the times in terms of technology, it did have its supporters. On the plus side were its slim layout, air cooling, which had its appeal off-road, very good cartridge forks, and excellent high-speed stability. If you fix the motor, the YZ made an excellent play bike and a solid desert racer. For motocross, it was a bit behind the times, but if you're looking for a machine that could do a lot of things well at a reasonable price, the YZ490 made a solid choice. Next up, we have the only four-stroke in our comparison, the 1988 ATK 604E. In Motocross Action's 500 shootout, they ranked the ATK first out of six entrants. Dirt Bike, Dirt Rider, and Super Motocross did not include the ATK in their rankings. Certainly the most unique machine to be found in any open class comparison in 1988 had to be the thundering thumper from Southern California, the ATK 604. The ATK featured an innovative design and hand-built craftsmanship made it to premium quality components from all over the world. Designed and built in the United States, the ATK brand was the brainchild of Austrian engineer Horst Leitner, who parlayed his idea for a torque-reducing drivetrain into a mini motorcycle empire. In 1989, ATK was actually the sixth largest manufacturer of off-road motorcycles in the world and a respected pioneer of off-road design. Introduced in 1984, the original ATK 560 was a revelation to a riding populace accustomed to overweight and uncompetitive four-stroke machines. The ATK used a massive 562cc air-cooled Rotax motor, premium Dutch white power suspension components, and Leitner's innovative A-Track anti-torque eliminator system to produce the most competitive four-stroke racer since the heydays of the thumpers in the early 60s. The 560 was big, heavy, and pricey at twice the cost of the typical Japanese 500, but it was also blazing fast, well-suspended, and exclusive. 
By 1988, the American Mega Thumper had adopted a new name in the 604 and a much appreciated electric start. This last edition was certainly the most important, as racing four strokes of this era were notoriously difficult to start, and a simple stall could mean the end of your moto. While the addition of the electric start added to an already heavy package, most riders of the era were more than happy to put up with the extra poundage in return for the assurance the big girl would start. On the track, the Mega Motored 604 put out an incredible flow of luscious vibes. Power was nearly seamless from bottom to top, and riders accustomed to the explosive power of a two-stroke found its endless torque intoxicating. There was none of the hard hit and fast revving drama common to racing four strokes today, just a slow and metered staccato of power pulses that clawed for traction and propelled the massive machine forward at warp speed. It was both the fastest and easiest to control of the open bikes, and like nothing else available at the time. Suspension performance was excellent as well, and tied for best in the shootout with its two stroke stablemate, the 406. Careful setup for each individual rider by the factory meant works level performance, and the white power 4054 forks and single no-link shock delivered a phenomenal ride and excellent control. The use of a countershaft mounted disc brake centralized mass and kept the brake out of harm's way, but a lack of airflow led to fading issues. Thankfully, this was less of a problem than the Big Thumper due to its massive engine braking. While the ATK 604 is picked as the best 500 of 1988 by motocross action, it was still a bit of an acquired taste. The motor's chugging delivery and extreme decompression braking took getting used to, and its jaw-dropping 262-pound weight demanded respect. Also, its astronomical $6,900 asking price put it out of the reach of most racers' budgets. Put frankly, it was a boutique racer for well-heeled buyers who appreciated unique flavor in their open-class racing. Next, we have the 1988 KTM 500 Motocross. Motocross Action ranked it 4th out of 6, Dirt Bike ranked it 3rd out of 4, Dirt Rider ranked it 3rd out of 5, and Super Motocross did not include it in their shootout. Of all the classes in motocross, the 500s were the last to fall to the relentless march of the Japanese onslaught. As recently as 1981, the best bikes in the 500 class were built by the Germans and Swedes, not the Japanese. By 1982, however, that lead was gone, as excellent bikes from Japan, combined with massive missteps from the old world brands, conspired to put a nail in the coffin of the European bike's dominance. The new Honda CR480R took the best traits of the legendary Makos and offered it for less money with better reliability and far more dealer support. By 1988, the last true holdout of the once powerful European contingent was Austria's KTM. Once sold as Pentons here in the US, KTM had proven to be one of the few European brands capable of putting up a fight against the Japanese. They were easily as advanced as the Japanese and regularly offered some of the fastest bikes available from any manufacturer, and their fit and finish rivaled anything from Japan. Where things got more complicated for KTM was typically in the suspension and handling department. While their suspension designs were advanced and used premium Dutch white power components, the setup was usually out of step with what American riders were interested in. Likewise, the Austrian machines tended to favor stability over turning, and that was not really in line with what most American riders were looking for on the tight tracks over here in the U.S. For 1988, KTM took major strides towards bringing back that lost European glory with an ultra-competitive open-class entry. The new MX500 featured an excellent motor that was head and shoulders better than the 1987 version, and very near the top of the 500 class in 1988. It ripped off the bottom and scorched through the middle before tapering off slightly in the upper revs. Its power band was very similar to the Honda's, but with a smoother delivery and a slightly longer pull on top. The clutch and transmission, however, were not as smooth as the Japanese machines, and that did hurt the KTM in the final standings. If you avoided the clutch and took your time with shifts, it was a willing participant, but if you tried to ride it too aggressively, the big Austrian clutch and transmission would revolt. While the motor was extremely competitive, the suspension was once again another matter. The KTM used the same components that were found on the ATKs, but received none of the laurels of their U.S. counterparts. Soft springs and harsh damping front and rear relegated them to last in the suspension rankings. The brakes were also incredibly poor and actually rated below the drum found on the Yamaha. The handling was remarkably good by KTM standards. And the Big Gatoom did a better job of changing direction than previous Austrian mounts. Stability continued to be the 500's strong suit, and the bike was unshakable at speed. Overall, the KTM was a very solid effort, and closer than ever before to the best from Japan. It was better than the long and the tooth Yamaha, but not quite up to unseating the green and red machines. Next up in our shootout standings is the 1988 ATK 406. MXA ranked it 6th out of 6, Dirt Bike did not rate it, Dirt Rider ranked it 5th out of 5 for motocross, but 1st out of 5 for off-road use, and Super Motocross did not rate the ATK in 1988. 
In 1988, ATK decided to expand their portfolio out of the four-stroke market into a full line of off-road machines. They hired longtime Can-Am ace John Martin to develop, market, and beef up their off-road lineup. Added for 1988 were a 250 and 406 two-stroke, both of which were powered by ancient Rotax two-stroke singles. These stone-reliable and claw-hammer simple motors from Austria had been used by Can-Am in the late 70s and early 80s and were considered quite powerful in their day, but by 1988, the era of power valves and liquid cooling had left them far behind. While perhaps not cutting edge in the motor department, the new 406 actually had a lot going for it in 1988. First of all was its weight, which tipped the scales at a jaw-dropping 215 pounds. This made it a staggering 22 pounds lighter than the next lightest machine. The motor was also incredibly simple to maintain, and there were no radiators to smash or hoses to drain when servicing the top end. The bike used the same white power suspension seen on the 604 four-stroke, and because every 406 was built to order, it was set up specifically for each customer. The A-Track torque eliminator took the binding out of the rear end, and the bike stuck to the track or trail like glue. Both the forks and shock were rated by Motocross Action as the best in the shootout. The motor, while no powerhouse, was quite usable and far less intimidating than a typical monster motor 500. The 406 was actually a bit of a throwback to a time when open-class bikes could actually be turned wide open without fear of looping out or being augered into the dirt. Once upon a time, RM370s and YZ360s ruled the open-class, and bikes were more about usability than staggering dyno numbers. This changed in the early 80s, but the 406 looked to put the friendly back in the 500 class. The 406's power was smooth and linear, with no abrupt hit or surge. It was fairly soft down low, before picking up in the mid-range and pulling to a decent top-end overrun. By modern open-class standards, the bike was actually pretty slow, and a good running CR250 or KX could probably beat it to the first turn, but this was not the whole picture. The 406 was easy to ride, and less tiring than other 500s. Where the 406's power shine was away from the track, where its mellow character shot it to the top of the standings. Handling was excellent, and the bike offered one of the slimmest layouts in spite of its generous fuel capacity. The airbox was mounted high in the front of the tank, and this helped make the 406 an absolute submarine off-road. Some riders found the 406's seat low and pegs high, but the seat itself was very comfortable. About the only ATK innovation that backfired was the bike's unique brake design, which mounted the rotor to the countershaft. This lowered unsprung weight and centralized the mass, but the tiny rotor was underpowered and prone to fading. Overall, the ATK 406 was an incredibly unique expression of the open bike concept. It was light, handled well, and had phenomenal suspension, but its old world motor held it back from the top level of motocross racing. For off-road use and overall fun, however, it was a really hard bike to beat, and Dirt Rider picked it as the best open class off-road racer in 1988. So there you have it. There's a look back at the 1988 500 class and how it ranked in the magazines at the time. I think a lot of people will probably be surprised to hear that uh, the 604 ATK actually won motocross action shootout. That bike, especially you think about a four-stroke, four-strokes weren't thought of being very competitive at that point. You know, the world had gone all two-stroke. Um, of course, the, the by modern standards, the 604 is a tank of a machine. Uh, but I think they were quite enamored with the power. Took a very different riding style. I mean, the thing weighed a ton. Uh, I never got to ride the 604. I have ridden uh, an ATK before, uh, but never the four-stroke. But, you know, to read it, it sounded like a phenomenal machine if you knew how to ride it well. You know, four-strokes, when I was a kid, they were always kind of a, you know, I thought of them as a toy, you know, an XR. I've had plenty of four-strokes, but I never thought of them as serious racers. And when you'd see guys at the track with a four-stroke, you kind of laughed. I was like, oh, look at that crazy guy riding a four-stroke. <laughs> you know, certainly the world has changed there. It's all four-stroke now. But um, the ATK was certainly unique for its time, and it's interesting that it ranked above, at least in Motocross Action's view, with the Japanese machines. Uh, the KX, I think most people probably thought the 88 uh, KX500 was the best machine in the, the 500 class, certainly in terms of two-strokes. And uh, it was a really good design that year, and really kind of basically the KX, they, they changed the motor a little bit the next year, but the basic design of 88 continued until 2004. Uh, Honda would get an update in 89, kind of get the all-new body work and stuff, but they never went with a power valve motor. They never really did a whole lot to this engine. They just kept sticking bigger exhausts on it and gearing it up to try and mellow it out trying to compete with Kawasaki's kind of smoother delivery with their KIPP system. Um, the, the Honda, though, this was a gnarly machine. You know, the mid-'80s Honda's 500s were just beasts, and every year they kind of mellowed them out a little bit, a little bit more. This 88, though, was a handful, I know. Um, I've ridden one of these, ridden an 87, 89, and oh, actually my buddy has an 89 right now. Um, and that thing is just a hard-hitting 
mother trucker. And then that uh, uh, KX500, his 88, is much smoother. It just has a much more linear kind of electric power band compared to the Hondas. And on a 500, I think that's something you want. You're not looking for max horsepower. Most people are not looking for more power out of the darn thing. They want it not to rip your arms out of your sockets when you get on it. So um, this is a great time for 500s. They, like I said, they were still getting a little bit of development, a little bit of love in the magazines. And uh, certainly uh, awesome machines to have today if you're a collector. So uh, if you like this sort of thing, if you check out the other videos, as I said, share on social media, like, comment, all the blah, blah, blah stuff. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, and until we meet again, this is Tardy Blazers with Motocross Vault. Keep the rubber side down. Peace.